had to see him in quite a while. He uh, has been depressed and he's staying in his room. But he said they found a, something in his esophagus that could be malignant. And he wanted us to pray. He's going to try to be here this Sunday. Let's pray for Ron quick that the Lord would help him and save him Amen. and heal him. Whatever needs to be done. I don't have the answer. All I know is I told him that we would pray. Isn't it wonderful that we can give these to the Lord? Perhaps there's another prayer request. Amen. Unspoken request. Sister Sheila got one. Sister Jocelyn. Sister Anna. All right, let's stand to our feet, everybody, and go to the Lord in prayer. In Jesus' name. Father, according to your word, all things are possible with them that believe. We're not a doubting people, oh Lord. We believe. We believe when we come in and we believe when we go out. We believe when we're up and we believe when we're down. We believe when we're sick and we believe when we're well. We thank you, Lord, for the unshakable faith that you have given to us. I pray for Ron that he can somehow get some stability in his life. That you would save that brother. That you would heal his body and preserve his life. And help his faith and extend all the needs and prayer requests here tonight. We know that God is able to do what nobody else can do. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, let us be the people of the name that we ought to be. To be the children of the Most High, the living God. And we give you all the glory and the praise and the worship. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Is there a special song tonight? No special song. Sister God's got a song tonight. Please be seated, everybody. God bless you, Sister God.
said to my husband the other day, I said, I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to fix it. And I'm not going to try. Because I'm just going to leave it in the hands of the Lord. Because God knows how to fix every situation. And so many times we take our hands to it. And we think we're going to fix it. But what we really do is we make it worse. And God said, I'm right here. I, I'm right here. I, I'm just, the Bible, there's a song that says, he's as close as the mention of his name. He's right here. 
good thing we got eternity. You know that? I'd like to preach about God tonight. Can I do that? Y'all believe in God out there? Oh, it's a wonderful feeling. You know, when the doctor looks at you and says cancer, you don't have God, it's pretty rough. Yes. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you something, it don't matter what the doctor says. If you got God, you can handle it. It's a piece of cake when you got the Lord. Everything's a piece of cake when you got God. You know what a piece of cake is? You know, that's what you how funny. I had a piece of cake a while ago. It was good. It was a double chocolate muffin. I didn't have a problem at all getting that down. I mean, I scarfed that down so fast, so easy. I, only problem was, I, I dropped crumbs all over the grass out here on the side, trying to get it down. And that's the way it is when you have the Lord. He comforts you. He blesses you. He talks to you. He, he helps you. God is everything, folks. Those of you that Maybe kind of halfway walking with the Lord. I want to encourage you to get on in there and walk with Him like you ought to. I want to encourage you to just believe no matter what happens. No matter what anybody says. No matter what takes place in your life. All things work together for the good. For them that love God.
We can talk about politics. We can talk about the Republicans or the Democrats. But we're not. Don't worry, bro. We're going to talk about something that really matters. Because God's going to be around when there ain't no Democrats and there's no Republicans and there's no United States of America. I want to be there too. John, the fourth chapter, it is such an amazing thing that the woman at the well got some deep theology. You don't know what deep theology is. Oh my goodness gracious, this Bible is so deep. That woman at the well got given something that is just totally amazing. Amen. The 20th verse of the 4th chapter, the woman at the well said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem, is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we Worship. I want you to kind of clip that on your brain right there. That, that one little phrase. We know what we worship. And I'll give you a little hint, folks. Them Jews were not worshiping a trinity. Got that? Amen. <laughs> That's one thing Jews did not do. Now you can accuse the Jews of a whole lot of things. But the Jewish people in the Old Testament had absolutely zero concept of a three person God. And Jesus said they were right because he said, Jesus wouldn't have said it. If it wasn't true, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, do you want to be a true worshiper? I guess there's some false worshipers, huh? The true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now folks, that's deep theology right there. And I'm glad Jesus said it and I'm glad John wrote it down. I'm sure probably the woman at the well didn't understand it, but it transformed that woman, and she was never the same, and she's probably the key to the revival that took place in Acts the 8th chapter, where Philip went down there, and there was a phenomenal revival. And I just want to tell you tonight that God's not a trinity Amen. of persons. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your word here tonight in the name of Jesus. We stand on the fact, O oh Lord, that you're the Holy One of Israel. You're the Holy God that revealed yourself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the understanding that we have of you. And we pray that we would never lose it. We pray that we would 
focus upon it and treasure it and love everything about your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. 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 You may be seated. I got a buddy at the YMCA. His name is Pete. He knows that I'm a preacher. He's been asking me about Luther and Erasmus and some of those guys back in the Reformation. He's really kind of intrigued about what took place when the Catholic Church, and when I say Catholic Church, I'm not wanting to say anything negative about anybody's denomination. I just want to tell you what history says about the Dark Ages and how there was a system of greed, a system of falsehood that extracted millions of dollars from a lot of people, caused suffering, difficulty, and problems. And I don't have time to go into all that happened, but one of the main things that they did was they attempted to obscure who God was. The devil really would like for us to get confused about who God is. And I want to say that I don't know as much about God as I want to know or as much as I'm going to know, but I thank God that I know Jesus. And they come up with this idea that there are three persons in the Godhead. The Bible most definitely tells us about Father and Son and Holy Ghost. There is no doubt. There is this, this, uh, this threeness of God. There is no doubt there is this diversity of God. God is more complex than we realize. But ladies and gentlemen, just because God said, let us make man, does not mean there's a trinity. Amen. I mean, how can you come up with a trinity with a just a plural pronoun? When over and over and over and over and over and over and over the Bible says there's one God. One God, one God, one God, holy one, not the holy three, not the holy two, but the holy one of Israel, ladies and gentlemen. You know, there's an explanation for these plural pronouns. Oh, yeah, there are plural pronouns in the Bible where God said, let us go down and see that, that, that uh, tower they got down there. But the Jewish people, Paul, and he was talking about the angels that went with him. Wasn't it two angels that appeared with God to Abraham in the plain of Mamre? When God had these two angels, well, those two angels weren't the Holy Ghost and, and the Son. They were angels. Plus, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have any problem at all with the word us in the Bible. You know why? Because it says in Romans, the fifth chapter, the 19th verse, that Adam was made in the likeness or the image of him that was to come. Which means when God took the clay and he formed the head and he formed the legs and he formed the arms and the fingers of Adam, he was looking into the future and he could see the Lord Jesus Christ. He could see the Son of God because that's the way God is, folks. He calls those things that be not as though they were. And he's already in the future, praise God. God was already there in 4 B.C. when the angels sang and praised the, the, the Son of God that was born on that beautiful Christmas day. Hallelujah. It was God that in the beginning that formed man from the dust of the ground. And he looked into the future and he said, let us make man. He's talking about the man Christ Jesus. He's not talking about another God. 
He's not talking about another deity. He's talking about that human being in whom he was going to live in. That human being in whom he was going to dwell in. That human being through whom he was going to speak to the world. That human being through whom he was going to redeem the world by the blood of the Lamb. All right. All right. I am made as a result of Jesus Christ. Both spiritually and physically. Yeah, Adam was made both spiritually and physically after him that was to come. So, forget this business about the father said to the son, son, I want you to go down there and I want you to die for the sins of the world. That's not in the Bible. There was no pre-existent son. The son did not pre-exist except as the Logos of God. You know what the Logos of God is? That's the word. When God said, let there be light, and there was light, the power behind the word that God spoke was such an anointing that things took place. Lightning struck, and thunder rolled, and things came into existence. That was the word. And the very word of God was made flesh. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. There was something on the inside of Jesus Christ that was a little more than any man had ever had before. There was something on the end. Oh, I get excited when I get to preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. There was something in him that he could speak. And it would happen. Amen. Lazarus, come forth. Amen. I can't do that. He would say, peace, be still. He could say, there won't be any more fruit on that fig tree forever. He could speak because the anointing yes. of God was in him. Amen. And he did pre-exist, but not as another person of God. He pre-existed as that power and that anointing that God, you, are you following me? Yeah. Maybe this is a little deep for you. I don't want to get in no hurry. Because the Catholic Church and a lot of churches believe that there are three persons. And the Son and the Holy Ghost pre-existed as uh, God the Son. And they want to attach. Now get this. You talk about not rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're going to read the Bible, you better connect that Bible with everything else in the Bible instead of just connecting it with what you think you ought to believe in. You can't look at the scripture, amen, and decide what you believe and then try to fit the Bible to fit what you believe. You have got to read the Bible with submission and say, this is what I believe, even though it kind of makes what I've got in my head. All right. There's a lot of folks believe that the angel of the Lord was the pre-existent son. And, you know, they really kind of have a, a little nugget of truth there in some ways. Because if you read about the angel of the Lord in the book of Exodus, the third chapter, where the scripture says that God, or excuse me, an angel, read it, read it, read it from what it says. It says an angel appeared to Moses in the form of a burning bush. Got that? He says an angel appeared to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And then the angel said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The ground you're standing on is holy ground. Take your shoes off. Because I'm going to send you down to the... And there was a long conversation between God speaking through an angel and Moses. Oh, so that's God the Son there, huh? Oh, yeah, that's God the Son. Right? Well, we got a little problem if that's God the Son. In fact, we got a big problem. Amen. <laughs> because we read about that angel a little bit later in the book of Exodus, the 23rd chapter, where God says, Now, Moses, there's going to, I'm going to send my angel, and he is going to lead you through the wilderness to the land of Canaan. But beware of him because he's not going to put up with your stupidity. 
He's not going to forgive your sins. He's not going to. He's not going to tolerate you lollygagging around. He's a pretty tough guy. Do y'all see the problem? This angel didn't want to forgive the people's sins. In fact, God was more forgiving than the angel was. But when you get in the New Testament, you see where Jesus kept saying, Thy sins be forgiven. He said to the, to the man that was paralyzed, when he saw the four that let him down through the roof, he said, Thy sins. Oh, that man, as far as we know, didn't even ask for forgiveness. But Jesus wanted to forgive the man's sins. The, the, uh, the, the sinful woman in Simon's house that washed his feet and wept and cried and shed tears and washed his feet with her tears and dried his feet with her hair. Jesus said, Thy sins be forgiven. And when they threw that little woman down in the 8th chapter of the book of John, and they said, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And we're going to stone her. You just tell us when to start. Jesus said, let him that is without sin among you cast the first stone. Oh, I don't know about you, but I kind of like the Son of God a whole lot better than I like the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. There's, there's, there's just a little flaw. There's a little fly in the ointment of some of these people's doctrines. And, and, you know, and folks, I, I just want to tell everybody here today that those Jewish people in the Old Testament were not worshiping a trinity of gods and didn't know it. The whole Christian world, I guess, believes, except us, we don't believe that the Jewish people were worshiping a trinity and didn't know it. <laughs> but the religious world of our day actually believes that the Jewish people that were taught there's one God, it was drilled into their minds. Daniel and the three Hebrew children went to the fiery furnace because they believed what God said in the book of Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They were willing to lay down their life. Amen. And to come along and say, well, you know, we found out now there really is three persons. And you were worshiping the Trinity all along. But Jesus blows that theory out of the water. And he told the woman at the well, we know what we worship. And we worship one sovereign, almighty, everlasting God. Amen. His name is Yahweh. And it is a word that is a riddle we don't understand it, and why would you think you could understand God's name? But he made it simple when he appeared as a manifestation in a human body, in the form of a man. And that word Yahweh is now changed to Yahweh has become my salvation. That's what the word Jesus means. Amen. And you know what the Holy Ghost is? Hey, it's not that hard to figure it out. And I, I, I tell people this all the time, and they don't have a response. They don't have a response. They can't. It's so simple. It's so easy to understand. Oh yes, there. You know, there's one guy on the on the computer that I converse with. He lives in England. He's a some kind of a, a technician, 
and uh, we, we get to talking, and, and uh, he uh, gives me all this uh, rigmarole about uh, the, the uh, Trinity or the threeness of God, and, and uh, you know, and, and so I, I say, well, okay, the Bible does say there are three. Do y'all know the Bible says there's three? First John 5 and 7. Did y'all know the Bible says there are three? But what I want to know is three what? It don't say there's three gods. It don't say there's three persons. It don't say there's three deities. It says there's three. Okay? There is one God and one man. And that one man is not a separate God. He's not another God. He is God in human form. Okay? So, that's two. But not two God. It's one God and one man. Everybody say one God and one man. That's how God saves us. He's one God and one man. That one man... I want to repeat it. I, I just want to drill this in your mind. That one man is not a separate God. He is God in the fact that God dwelt in him. In him. In him is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Bible says God was in Christ. And he still is in Christ. If you want to find God, I'll tell you where God's at. He's headquartered in the resurrected man, Christ Jesus, that sits upon the throne of heaven. And that's where you'll find Almighty God. If you want to hear the voice of God, you listen to the words that come out of that man's that man's mouth, that man's vocal cords. That is where God is at because there is one God and one mediator between. God and me. Amen. Most of it wasn't that there. You and me would be up a creek without a pass. Because to look at God is to be blinded. To look at God is to see a consuming fire. Amen. To, to be around God is so holy that you shake and tremble in your shoes. And you can't even think whenever you get in God's presence. But when you get in the presence of Jesus, hallelujah, it's, it's a whole lot different. It's a whole lot better because we've got a mediator. We've got a man that's got scars in his hands. We've got a man that's got scars in his brow. We've got a man, hallelujah, that intercedes for us. We've got a man that is our best friend. We've got a man that was continually touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And he wants to forgive our sins. He wants to plead our cause before the throne of God. He wants to be our advocate. He wants to be our intercessor in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. So we got two, but not two divine persons. Okay, where's this third one at? <laughs> the spirit of that man. The human spirit of Jesus. Did you folks know Jesus had a human spirit? Now I know there's a whole, 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 whole lot of wondrous people, bless their hearts, that thinks that Jesus didn't have a human spirit. Okay. Go ahead and believe what you want to believe about it. But the Bible said that he grew in his spirit. Amen. Read the first chapter of the book of Luke. The scripture says that he grew in spirit and in stature before God and men. Hello? Amen. Does the Spirit of God grow? No. He's talking about his human spirit. Amen. On the cross, as Jesus was dying, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. gave his human spirit to God. Amen. That human spirit was made one with God. Right. United together as the human body of Jesus was united together. All right. Oh, hallelujah. 
And so, folks, when we get the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, we don't get the third person of the Godhead. We get the Spirit of Jesus. That's made one with the Spirit of God. And that's what makes the Holy Ghost so powerful. It's my general superintendent that totally agrees with me on this issue because we've had long conversations about it. And when I found out, he said, Brother Khan, I put that in two of my books. All right. I believed it before I even knew that. And this is what my beloved general superintendent said. I don't want to get into trouble with anybody, but there's a whole lot of people out there that just want to nitpick about every little thing they can find and find fault and try to label you a heretic over things that they don't have enough sense to come here uh, to, to know anything about. Amen. It's really sad. You don't believe it just like I believe in your heretic. Well, why don't you study your Bible and maybe you'll find out that you can learn a little something. All right. From the great theologians like David Bernard. Anyway. When we get the Holy Ghost, we get the power to submit. The power that Jesus had. He submitted to the Father, did he not? Did he, does anybody need a little help submitting to the Father? Huh? Is anybody in here, you just submit to God all the time and your flesh just surrenders to God and you just don't have any struggle at all? Huh? I need help submitting to the Father. I need help getting my flesh under subjection. And when Jesus prayed in the garden, Father, not my will, but thine be done. That was not theatrics, ladies and gentlemen. There was a human will that was involved in going to the cross. He did not want to go to the cross. But he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. He wasn't just saying that to look good. He wasn't just saying that like some folks want to think, that he was just play acting. That was real conversation. Amen. From a human being All right. that didn't want nails driven in his hand. Amen. Any more than you are in Amen. Amen. Hello? And yet, Jesus said, nevertheless. I guess in some ways, folks, that probably is the center of circumference of the entire word of God. Because if Jesus had not have said, nevertheless, not my will, we would all be in hell right now. Amen. We would have no hope tonight. But because he submitted he gives me the power to submit when I speak in tongues, when I pray in the Holy Ghost. My flesh doesn't want to submit to God. There's a rebellion in my heart, but there's an antidote for the rebellion. There is a cure for the rebellion that's in our heart, and it's called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's not my theology only. That's David Bernard's theology. And that's what I believe. And that's what you need to read your Bible. And you need to understand. And yeah, there are three, but not three persons. Not three divine beings. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. And that man had a human spirit also. Amen. And that's the Holy Ghost. Now how hard is that to understand? They say all the Trinity is a mystery. It ain't no mystery. Oh, yeah, that Catholic Trinity is a big mystery. <laughs> because here you got a son way back there in eternity, but you don't have a mom. Do you? The mom was Mary, wasn't she? Okay. Well, did Mary pre exist? Was Mary a God? No. So we got a problem here. That is a mystery. Isn't it? Amen. And so it's
it's not what you think it is. And I, I could go on and on and on, but uh, Mary did not pre-exist. She's not the queen of heaven. Although there is some Catholic theology that teaches that Mary is the queen of heaven. And they have her back there having a child. And that child was begotten in eternity. Now, how ridiculous is that? Do you folks know what begotten means? Yeah, you do. It means you have a beginning. It means you were born. It means you came into existence. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Deities don't come into existence. They exist from eternity to eternity. They have no beginning. If it had a beginning, then it's not deity. If it was begotten, then folks, the humanity of Jesus is not a separate deity. It is a tabernacle in whom God dwelt. And that's the deity of God, is what was in Christ. Amen. Because we fought a battle back in 02. It was called divine flesh heresy. It swept through the United Pentecostal Church and in foreign fields. It affected Africa and different parts of the world because there are people that believe that the humanity of Jesus was divine. That it wasn't like us. But folks, if it wasn't like us, then how could it be tempted in all points like as we are? Do you folks believe that Jesus was tempted in all points like we are? And because he was tempted in all points like we are, he knows how to get us out of that temptation. Isn't that exciting? I love the oneness of God. I love the truth that I grew up in a little Pentecostal church in Bader, Texas. Yeah, there might have been kind of Hickville down there, but somehow or another, God revealed this wonderful truth of the oneness of God to my pastor and to those people around me, and they transferred it to me. I'm hanging on to the truth of the oneness of God. I want this church to never forget that this church is based upon what Peter said, upon this rock. That, that God's going to build his church, and that rock is that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. By the way, Son of God. Isn't that an interesting terminology? Son of God means God manifest in the flesh. It's a perfect one this term. It's not Trinity. Don't ever be afraid to say Son of God. That's in the Bible. The angel said, That holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. God himself said, This is my beloved Son, and whom I'm well pleased. Amen. Amen. Paul, the first sermon Paul ever preached, read the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. Paul said, The Bible says that Paul preached that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. And John, the revelator, said, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you're calling God a liar. And I highly advise you don't call God a liar. God's not a liar. But the devil would like to obscure who Jesus is. There's a spirit of Antichrist that has come along. It began, you can read about it, in the last three letters of John, when John mentioned that there is a spirit of Antichrist, it is a lying spirit. And that spirit would like for you to deny the Son. And if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. Hello? Don't go around saying, I don't believe the Son of God. Don't go around saying, I don't believe there's a man up there in the heavens that resurrected from the dead. Don't go around thinking that 
Jesus just somehow disappeared and he no longer exists. That's what the spirit of Antichrist wants you to think. Amen. If it wasn't for that mediator, that advocate, that intercessor, we'd be all in trouble. And the devil would love nothing more than to get rid of him. If you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. But if you acknowledge the Son, you have the Father also. Amen. Put it up there, Brother Joel. 1 John 2, 22, 23. Oh, I, we're going to have to conclude with this. I know I probably get too excited about it, but I'm preaching about God. I'm preaching about the mystery of God. I'm preaching about the oneness, of, the beautiful oneness, the, the oneness that we need to hang on to and believe. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. There was a Gnostic gospel that believed that Jesus didn't have a real human body. That he had what was called a phantom body. And that when he hung on the cross, he didn't really hurt. He didn't really bleed. It was just a phantom. It was just a, a ghost. But that's a lie. That was the first way that the devil tried to deceive the human race about who Jesus was. Who is a liar but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denied the Father and the Son. Next verse. Whoso denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son. What, how do you acknowledge the Son? Say that loud, brother. Thanks, me. I tell you how you acknowledge the Son when you call on His name and say, Jesus. Amen. You're the Son of God. You're God in human form. You're God manifest in the flesh. You're God Almighty. Revealed. Okay. I'll stop screaming now. I'll let you talk a while. I'm sure there's some confused minds out there. I'm sure there's probably some folks that are kind of got a furrowed brow. Maybe you're afraid to ask your question. I welcome any question anybody has here right now. Or any clarification. Anyone? Yes, Brother Junior. I don't have a question, but I got a statement. You know what you're saying about it. Brother Junior's got a statement. That they have a pen on body. Or pen on body. body. Well, Romans, the 8th chapter, the 3rd verse, says that God came to the light. In the likeness of sinful flesh. You know, a new living translation says, uh, you know, it came in the body like we sinners. You know, that's, if it came in a phantom body, it wouldn't be in the likeness of sinful flesh. There you go. In the likeness of, you know, sinful flesh. So that, right there. <laughs> there you go. Jesus came. God came in the likeness of sinful flesh. But it wasn't sinful flesh. Jesus' body was pure, holy, sinless, undefiled, clean. That's why God could inhabit that body. Now, there's people that want to deny the deity of Jesus and say, well, the fullness of God is in us. But I got news for everybody, folks. The Bible says in him, Beware lest any man spoil you. Give me Colossians 2, 8, 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. Godhead. Headquarters of God. You don't know what the headquarters of the U.S. military is. It's a place in Washington, D.C. called the Pentagon. That's where the Joint Chiefs of Staff live. And, and they run the military. There is a four-star general for the, for the Marines, for the Navy, for the 
uh, Army, Air Force, all those guys, they're experts. They are career, I mean, they know how to blow up bombs. They know how to dispense armies. They know how to send drones. They are very wonderful at protecting our country, right? right. It's sad that we've got to have a military like that, but we've got evil out there. But we've got bases all over the world. We've got Air Force bases in, in Germany, military bases in Korea. We've got floating military bases in the form of aircraft carriers. Thousands of soldiers ready to be deployed. The military, though it's global, is controlled by one little spot over there in Washington, D.C., called the Pentagon. Okay? God is everywhere. Do you folks know God's everywhere? His spirit fills the heaven of heavens. He cannot be contained. He is everywhere present at the same time. It blows my mind when I think about God. But he said, the headquarters of God is in that man. That's why he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He's got, Jesus has got all power. Until all enemies are put beneath his feet. When that happens, the last enemy is going to be death. When death is defeated, things are going to change. We won't need a mediator. We won't need a savior. We're all going to be saved or lost. You're either going to be in heaven or hell. That's when God's going to return to being like he was before sin entered the world. He will become all in all, and God will be able to control everything that goes on because that's the way God Junior, did you have your hand back? Uh, I was curious. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, how some people believe that. Talk loud. Some people believe that. After Jesus' resurrection, he ascended and disappeared. Yeah, there's people. So Honestly, there's people that believe Jesus disappeared. He went poof and no longer exists. That's crazy. That's Antichrist. Forgive me, I took a I was just curious, how, how do they reconcile that, that scripture you just read with that belief? How, how's that argument? They don't reconcile. The problem is, some folks are nervous about the resurrected man, Christ Jesus. Okay? Peter wasn't nervous about the resurrected man, Christ Jesus, was he? No. Thomas fell at his feet and said, my Lord and my God. Who do we think we are that we think that we can eliminate the resurrected Christ? Because if you've got a resurrected Christ and an eternal spirit that fills the universe... Then some folks have the goofy idea you have two gods. How in the world can that be two gods? When the Bible says there is one God and one man. Man, man. Everybody say man. Man. Say it again. Man. Man. Man, 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 man. Christ Jesus. Resurrected. Do y'all folks know God didn't resurrect? It was the man that resurrected. Amen. Was it the man that resurrected or was it God? Was it the man that died or was it God that died? Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't get so emotional. Paul said in Romans, the seventh chapter and the fourth verse. Put it up there, Brother Joel. I know I'm going long. But I just love the word of God. I love who Jesus is. I love this message. I want everybody to believe the word of God. 
that we are married to him that rose from the dead. What does that say? Wherefore, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. That's who we're married to. Who's that? That's the man. The man. The man. The man, Christ Jesus. Oh, some folks, they read my book and they say, one guy said, I got so tired of reading about the man Christ Jesus, the man Christ Jesus. That's all you wanted to talk about is the man Christ Jesus. What? Well, isn't that what we sing about? Amen. The mighty God is Jesus, the Prince of Peace is He. The everlasting Father, the King eternally. The wonderful and wisdom by whom all things are made. The fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is displayed. It's all in him. Who is him? The man Christ Jesus. Why do we sing things that we don't believe? Or we don't understand? Or we're confused about? Huh? And we get all huffy over things that we don't need to get huffy about. It's all in him. The advocate, the high priest, the lamb for sinners slain, the author of redemption, oh glory to his name. Sometimes we don't even know what we're saying. We're singing about the man Christ Jesus. And you need to get used to the man Christ Jesus. Because you're never going to see God. You're never going to look upon the face of God. You're never going to see one inch of God. Because God is invisible. Amen. And if you were to see God, you would evaporate. But you're going to behold God when you look into the face of that man, Christ Jesus. Right. That's how you're going to see Almighty God. All right. So don't do away with the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. Rejoice. But you've got a pastor that taught you the truth of the Word of God. Amen. All right. And I have waited through hell to be able to preach this and to believe this because, believe it or not, there's a whole lot of people that don't like this message, but it is the truth anyway. Amen. And I thank God that there's all kinds of people all over Pentecost that believe it this way. Amen. Amen. Please forgive me. I should not have got so mean right there at the end. I'm sweet. I really am. If you were to ask my wife, she would tell you how sweet I am. <laughs> but I'm not a compromiser. When it comes to the Word of God, I believe the Word of God. Like the song says, if it's written in the Bible, I believe it until I die. Though the mountains be removed and cast into the sea, God's word will last forever throughout eternity. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, everybody. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Lord, we thank you.